you know, Jeffrey gave a series of beautiful lectures on noise and dynamics. And my goal today is just to connect this to kind of flows that we care about, continuous time flows. And uh, I'll try to do it as simple as possible. It can be done more formally. And when I'm done, it'll just connect. Basically, I'll show that for noise, you can also go to Poincaré maps. And from then on, the argument that was developed by Jeffrey will work. And we'll do this in a, something that's the harmonic oscillator for, non, for stochastic dynamics. So the basic thing that anybody who learns about stochastic dynamics learns. And it's even more so that it turns out that it's just a complex time rotation away from quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator. So it's even literally a harmonic oscillator. The only difference is being that in stochastic processes, instead of oscillations, you have exponential decays. But the structure of the problem is the same. So we we'll look at the linear flow plus white noise. And we do this for arbitrary dynamical system, whereas Einstein and Uhlenbeck did it for uh, you know very physical systems that our experimentalists in biophysics use all the time. <coughs> so basically, this is a system where you have something that produces quadratic potential. For example, you have laser lights that keep a styrofoam ball confined in a region. And Brownian motion kicks this ball, and that's described by Einstein and Ulmex. So usual diffusion is the simplest case is you all have open space. You put drop of something and molecular motion spread it out diffusively. You have continuous translational invariance. And that's you know called Einstein Einstein diffusion. That's one of the beautiful papers of uh, 1905 that young Einstein wrote. And Einstein back does the same, but they put it in potential. It turns out you can do it analytically, just like you can do a quantum harmonic oscillator analytically. And I'll just take a bare bone of it. So this might be, I don't remember, but maybe it's 1932. Maybe it's much later. So Einstein and Ullenbeck, or they look at state space, there is a d-dimensional state there, and they say that the response is linear. So if I'm away from the origin, the state gets multiplied by the matrix. And this problem is very easy to understand if uh, this matrix has only contracting eigenvalues. So this is conveniently just written as that, meaning not the matrix is smaller <coughs> negative or elements of matrix are negative. It means that its eigenvalues are negative. So what it means is that no matter what you do, you linearly get uh, pushed into the origin. And we know how to solve this problem. So we know that for that deterministic problem at time t, <coughs> your e times a t minus t zero, whatever you were at initial time. So this is a real matrix, and this is really the usual matrix. It's really the matrix of velocity gradients, a stability matrix. But as this is a linear problem, and this matrix is constant, it's a value just at the origin. This is the simplest possible of the problems. Now stochasticity comes in saying, OK, now I'll add here noise. So what that noise means is that I get contracted in some small time step by the matrix, which has, if I put it in some kind of upper triangle form, it's just negative coefficients. So its eigenvalues are negative, right? eigenvectors of this matrix. So I'm getting contracted in all the dimensions in this very simple example. 
but the noise doesn't care, it tries to shove me away. So if there was no potential, if some of the eigenvalues were zero, I would get Brownian diffusion, or just diffuse in the way that you know, Einstein diffusion formula describes. And now, you know, how you balance these two things. Uh, Jeffrey explained it, how you do it for maps, and I'll explain that doing it for flows and maps is the same thing on the level of approximation that we are using. So the idea will be that we'll use linearized flow. So this will actually depend on where we're in state space because stability matrix changes because velocity field changes every place over the state space. And we will uh, have varying noise over the state space. So there will be regions of state space that are very noisy and the ones that are less noisy. And you'll see that's actually inevitable when I go to the maps that just the way it is. It can never be uniform, but for simplicity we'll just assume for now that it's uniform. And we have to specify what this noise is. So the way this is done is by describing its probability distribution. And the simplest assumption you can do is that you assume that the noise in a mean doesn't have drift. So it means the particle is moving on the trajectory in general. Right now it's just going to a fixed point, but in general it will move on any trajectory in the dynamical system. And the noise will be something that will kick me around. And we will require, and that's probably not actually that's not, that's it, but for simplicity, we all assume that the noise is full dimensionality. So even though I'm in million dimensions, the noise is kicking me in million dimensions. <coughs> now, how it's kicking in million dimensions is described by correlation tensor, correlation matrix. And what you do is it's just matrix with d squared elements built from, you know, vector this way and vector that way. So just a matrix. And transpose, you'll see it's convenient to use notion of transpose. And we will require that this noise is described by a core, you know, diffu so-called diffusion matrix. So that means if we remove the linear flow and just look at the fixed point without this part in it, this will connect to the usual theory of Brownian diffusion in isotropic medium. But uh, we can easily require that this thing depends on orientation. So the simplest example, you know, is and that's really Einstein will make an example. If this is a harmonic oscillator of one dimension, then harmonic oscillator has a phase space that's two dimensional. So Hamiltonian system, the state space is phase space, and in that case it's two dimensional. So you know example is that uh, if X is Q and P spatial and momentum dimension, then this equation here is Hamiltonian equation. It says that x dot, which we call you know, in our abbreviated notation velocity, and this is velocity in the phase space, this is not velocity in the usual, meaning is Hamiltonian dq minus Hamiltonian, no, not d, dp, I'm sorry. Hamiltonian dq. So these are usually like Hamiltonian equations. And the first one tells you that the first component or first d components of that, if you have d degrees of freedom, this is just momenta. So mass is time velocity, physical momenta, physical velocity. And this component are accelerations because this is the real gradient of potentials. So it tells me how the momentum is changing. So in Brownian motion, what happens is that trajectory is continuous 
in time. So the noise can only be put into a random kicks, which I assume to be instantaneous. So it's put in this term. So in that case, this diffusion matrix uh, has zero elements on things that would make jumps in space, because you don't allow particles to jump in space, but you allow them to accelerate. So that's an example of the fusion matrix. And of course, in one dimension, it's very simple. First component is zero, and second component in Einstein notation is called two uh, for, and then uh, for left and right, and then D for diffusion. So Einstein diffusion formula looks like that, as the simplest example. But then when I look at this object, I realize some, there's something wrong dimensionally about this formula, because what diffusion says, correlation on noisy trajectory, so two element, now I'm just putting indices on it. Then Einstein diffusion formula says this is the diffusion matrix in in one dimension, this we call 2D, but it can be anisotropic, so let's call it just this Dij. But it has to be proportional to time. So in diffusion, <coughs> the uh, distance you get away from the origin in time, T, it's the square of the distance that's growing linearly. And it all, all, it all just means is that you're adding errors, and the way you add errors is that you add square of the errors and it takes square root. So in time, so it means that when I define this diffusion tensor, I have to specify the time when I'm taking a little infinitesimal step. So usually when people teach stochastic processes, on, they don't write this equation quite like what I've written it, but uh, you know that's the meaning. And uh, Noise being white means that you assume it's uncorrelated in time, but uh, it uh, depends. It can depend on where you're in state space, the local noise, and uh, you know it means it's essentially Gaussian. So higher correlations, once I specify two-point correlation, I know all the correlations because for Gaussian that's complete specification of probability distribution. Now, it's a low large number, so Gaussians are natural for small time steps because you explore small neighborhoods, and in those neighborhoods, things tend to be Gaussian, even if you don't have a non-Gaussian noise. So I don't think that's criminal for infinitesimal steps. But what I've done here, I've snuck in something that bothers me to no end. You know, I've actually, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do it very soon. Okay. I've snuck in norm, but it'll be a little bit more obvious very soon. So now, how can I use the information that noise is specified only at quadratic level, whereas my equation is linear? What I say is, I say, well, I can write the equation what happens in short time interval. In short time interval, what happens is that, in principle, going to infinity, this will be proportional to the original delta x. So let me label time by a little integer. You know, and, 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 and. So short times, this is time n. And here am I time n plus 1. And for simplicity, we, well, it doesn't really matter. It can be variable interval. We just all have to go small simultaneously. So in short time, I, uh, and in short time, what happens in time is that I get a Jacobian here because, well, this is differential equation instantaneous in time. For short times, what happens is if I have a displacement from the no. origin in this case, then you'll get deformed by Jacobian that uh, is evaluated at this time and goes short time step forward. I'll add to it noise, this depends where I was at that time. Now to use this information, 
I am interested in saying every individual trajectory is looks like a Brownian walk, but you know it's it's going to be down the trough. It won't be Brownian walk every place, but so jerking around uh, in the bottom of a laser light well or something. So every individual trajectory looks something like that. And together they form a cloud of trajectories. So what I really care about whenever I have Langevin or stochastic trajectories, I don't care about individual trajectory because that will be realized only in one experiment for one sequence of noises. I want to average an ensemble of them. So what I really want to look at is I want to look at covariance, which I define covariance at time t. I define it as this is again full state space matrix. It's how big are these little deviations. So that's definition where this is average. And what, what this law says is that naively, and you know that's when things come, in a, every experiment on average I don't drift away. So if this was non-zero, I would be going someplace on average, but this is zero. But instead of it, the neighborhood is spreading in time proportional to time. The, so you think covariance matrix. So in every experiment that you do, you know, the thing will just fall apart after all. But that's not true because you have a confining potential. So you know you try to go away and potential pushes you back. So then what we do is we compute Q, I, J, and you know, I'll call it N, where N just means at time N, and it really means it's the trajectory, the deterministic trajectory is sweeping out space, so at that time I'm someplace in space, and I only care where I'm in space when I'm looking at noise, because if the noise is time dependent, then forget it, you know, then you have to do another problem, explaining What's the time dependence of you know if you have an experiment on the th third floor up there and your noise changes from day to day, then you know a new theory has to be developed for that. So it's assumed that you control it. The temperature of your uh, medium is the same, so the Brownian motion is the same in every experiment on average. So then I can use this equation here. Uh, to compute how does the covariance at time n plus 1 look by knowing how it does it before, and that is evaluated the previous, deterministically deforming, shearing the neighborhood in time d. So that's what Jacobians are. This is a linearized thing, transpose, and then averaged. So the covariance at next time is related to covariance at previous time because we see that this is bilinear. And we remember that for short times, Jacobian, which is usually a time-ordered integral of the stability matrix is just for short times you can assume the stability matrix doesn't change much. You just evaluate it once and you go delta t. And if you expand it to the first order as a Taylor series, so this is a matrix exponential, so you can write it as a Taylor series, to first order you just get delta t a plus stuff order delta t and that will throw away. Linear flow. So that means that I have a formula here. So the first term, 1 times this, the first term will be the average of the previous time, so time n. Okay, so we pick up a term which is delta t, and a multiplying this. Diffusion matrix implying delta. But you can see this is, by definition, previous covariance. Then this is the previous covariance. And then I pick up a term where it's a transpose of A on the other side showing up. And then finally, I had to average 
or the product of two noises, but that's diffusion matrix times the delta time. And then there are terms of higher order in delta t that I've dropped. So I look at it, I get a very beautiful equation, which is the same, I'll show later, as the equation that Jeffrey started with. So the beautiful equation says, says that q equals the previous q ij plus something that's delta t something, q at times n plus 1 as a matrix minus q at the previous time n plus. This is all proportional to delta t, this term here, delta t, so I can divide it out, delta t. And what it says is it's either, this comes from linearization from keeping the shorter step, either you shear the, this matrix from the left or you shear it by the transpose from the right and you add noise to it. And this is obviously time derivative, so we have an equation that says a differential equation for the covariance matrix that said in time it transports like, so he was kind of contributor, competitor to Poincaré, he was a Russian aristocrat. And uh, this equation he found in studying stability of systems like solar system, because the big question was, you know, are celestial problems stable? And it's got nothing to do, to best of my knowledge, with what we call Lyapunov. Nothing to do with Lyapunov exponents. But it is Lyapunov equation. And it has immense literature on it because it's a central equation of control theory in engineering. So what happens in engineering, instead of having random perturbations, they try to apply particular perturbations to the system to achieve control. And, uh, you know, it has the same structure and the covariance matrix in that case is not over ensemble, but it's designed by specific pushing. And then there are various theorems about this and without the literature, we, you know, Domenico, Jeffrey and I who worked out what I want to explain, uh, would not have figured it out because actually at some point you have to think. I mean, it's, you know, I'm doing this totally physicist way, very simple, but at some point you have to do a Cauchy contour. <laughs> and that's yeah, not obvious even when you teach it in many mathematical math courses. It's not obvious that you're supposed to do it. So, this is the equation. And now the question is how to solve it. When Jeffrey wrote the Puna equation, it was done for maps. So this equation in literature appears in two versions. So this one is called continuous, meaning continuous in time. And this one is called discrete in time. And in engineering, discrete is very natural because every so often you apply control. Uh, for us, continuous is more natural, but both are equally good. And this equation that was written before, I like to understand much better. It says that a discrete time n plus 1, what happens is you take the previous covariance. So what's a covariance? Covariance is you have a trajectory and to the quadratic order description is given by ellipsoid saying you how you fit the cloud of neighboring trajectories in a noisy cloud and you fit it by a cigar to leading order. So covariance matrix is a description of this cigar. Covariance matrix symmetric it has singular values and singular vectors and uh, singular vectors tell you how this thing is oriented and singular values tell you how thick it is in different directions. In one, one dimension, singular values is called standard deviation, but in higher dimensions you need 
a little bit more language to describe it. So the discrete thing is extremely intuitive. It says you take these guys and deterministically multiply in Jacobians. So there's a Jacobian here. There, for some reason, we use letter M, and now we, I'm using letter J. M was for monodromy, and J is for that. So it says, I take the cigar, and flow deforms it by acting on each X in it. So that's why I get J, Q, J transpose, because this is bilinear in noise. And then I kick it, and that's described by delta and I assume that time step delta t equals 1, so don't write it explicitly. But that is very intuitive. It says, how do I collect errors? I take my original errors, I square my original error, add to it the new error squared, and uh, you know, that gives me, the sum of them gives me, because errors add like squares, if you're writing covariances. So discrete and continuous, and now I'll show you know at some point I'll show they're the same. But so yeah. Nine equals Q M Q M plus one equals something Q M plus one. That's, That's very bad. Thank you. And of course everybody has this index someplace, because everybody in general depends on where this was evaluated. So all these matrices depend on variance state space, and the covariance itself also depends on time, meaning how many steps are went away. Now it turns out, for this kind of Gaussian process, if you are looking at it, and linear as approximation, this is one-to-one. -one. But there is lesson to be learned anyhow. And now there is a thing that nobody thinks about when they say this, but you know, it bothers me to no end, is that the moment I have written these things here, the linear form, I'm really defining norms. I'm really saying how important is particular coordinate. Now, I've just written in Euclidean way, so you didn't see it. But when I want to, uh, you know, so you can think of it that this is the norm. You know, you can think that you can rescale the coordinates locally, so they're just uh, orthogonal coordinates, and this tells you how you weigh them, the singular values of this matrix. But, you know, one thing that happens is that your original system, which was x dot is some law of nature, or not, you know, some made-up law, <coughs> That could have had all kinds of symmetries. The moment you add noise to it, you seem to be destroying them. See, so noise is... So many results will derive in the course on the other hand of this floor uh, are very beautiful because they are invariant under all coordinate transformations. The moment I had noise, I actually chose a coordinate system because I have to describe noise in particular coordinates. Because if I uh, change my coordinates, this diffusion tensor is changing, etc. So I'm, I'm, uh, you know, by having gone here, I've actually done something that might be criminal, and I will leave it at that. In other words, I don't really know how we include noise, whether we should uh, insist that noise respects symmetries or not. You know, what are the physical situations we okay. care? But the way it's written right now, no matter how beautiful the system was originally, the noise have made it uh, devoid of symmetry. So I have this equation, can I solve it? So it turns out, and again we enormously help by the fact that engineers have to do this. This equation shows up all the time in linear way of thinking. So, for example, Dmitry is not here, but his advisor, Paul Goldberg, is a linear kind of guy, so he thinks of deformations of the medium, soft material medium in various, you know, very good physical contexts. Studies it to quadratic order in deformation, and turns out this equation shows up. 
uh, because anytime when you're looking at something that's deterministic but you're looking at covariances or you can stress tensors or you're looking inertia tensors okay, the, and you do this in the first non-trivial order you get this equation and people know how to solve this equation so what I'll do is I will write the solution and then we'll just check that it's a solution and it, it probably you know, in some form we have seen it already sometimes uh, so remember A the way we'll use it the stability matrix is defined on the trajectory so it depends on time it's d by d matrix and the noise same story it depends through time indirectly through where I'm on the trajectory so then these two matrices so we have those and we would like to determine this other matrix, the cigar of neighborhood at time t, that we know what initial one. Now this is a linear problem, so if I know how to do this for delta function, I know how to do it for anything because I can add it up. So it's just like theory of Green's functions in other subjects in quantum mechanics. Yeah, it's linear in Q's, but it has this little thing that doesn't make it look linear to me at least. So here is the solution. And solution is that Q at time t is the original Q at time t zero, but it's being deformed by finite time Jacobians. So now I'll write them a little bit more explicitly. Jacobian that I start at time t zero and end up at time t, and I also need the transpose because the other component goes like the transpose of it. And I have to remind you that only for rotation group transpose is inverse. In general it's not because in general these are not symmetric matrices. So, so this is really transpose is very different from the inverse. Right? So that's one thing. So it says I started here So this is a time t0. And after some other time you get a different guy whose same axes are described by q at time t. So the thing by design is sitting center on deterministic trajectory, but it's being smeared out. So you can think description is now you're mapping distributions and into distributions rather than computing trajectory from point to point but it turns out it's not a big deal because it's kind of linear sorry and now what about this term so that takes care of this term what about the other term well what happens is that in any intermediate time the noise can kick in, give you a kick. But as we are doing this leading order in uh, time, once it kicks in, you can't do it twice, there will be second order in time. So it doesn't show up. So we find out that at any point noise can show up at time tau in between. And then once I have this you know, displacement trajectory for the rest of the time is being deterministically deformed. And then I go to my final time. So that's the solution. And even though my argument was just for a fixed point where this thing is not changing in time, etc., and the noise is not changing because all a computer at a fixed point. It's actually true for any trajectory, and in particular, it would be true for periodic trajectories, which, whenever you look at the point on periodic trajectory, that looks like a fixed point for the evolution by that time. So it's generally true. Now, if you don't believe me, I told you what I think these two terms mean. All you do is you take time derivative of this side and you use 
the fact that time derivative Jacobian is a stability matrix that Jacobian. So that was our evolution equation. So we take derivatives, it'll, they'll put these A's down if you take derivative left hand side. And the sandwich of Jacobian will bring me to uh, time Q, so I'll get Q's. And for the last term, I'm just looking at perturbation for short time at the very end. So I'll look at the end of the interval, but Jacobian doesn't have time to kick in, so it'll be 1, delta 1, so you get that term. So by inspection, this is the solution. So now, how does this relate to what Jeffrey explained in this part of these noisy lectures? What I can do, I can decide to put here ticks where T1 equals 1, T2 equals 2, etc. Or I can, uh, what's, what's more physical, I can look at a Poincaré section of my big space. So here am I in the big world and state space. And in the Poincaré section, in Poincaré section what happens is I start someplace. Deterministically I go around. Tuk, 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 tuk. And then I re-emerge someplace else. And then these ticks are topological ticks, so these times might be different, but I just measure I'm here at time Txn, and here I'm at time Xtn plus 1. And now what happens is, in the meantime, there is a noise on this thing. So if I started with some covariance matrix, and here I'm glossing about one thing that I should have said. We know that for the flows, for example, periodic orbits, there's always one marginal direction. If you have a marginal direction, it means that nothing is confining me. So I have diffusion. But if I'm on a periodic orbit, there'll be diffusion along a compact sect, along periodic orbit. So one should really think also how I diffuse along the orbit, but that's kind of trivial because I can assume I've already diffused and I have the equilibrium measure. Because if I'm on a compact set, what will happen? If I start any place after a sufficient long time, I'll uniformly cover the whole thing by diffusion. So that marginal direction probably one should think more carefully about, but I haven't. And, uh, you know, I find out that the transverse directions are smeared out. And that's covariance time later. But this formula is a correct formula for any finite time. Because if A is a sensible matrix, so it doesn't diverge any place. So you have a smooth flow where you're interested. And the noise is sensible. So it doesn't mm -hmm. I become infinite noise any place. Then this is a finite integral for any finite time. The only issue that might arise is that if this matrix had expanding directions, then at a long time limit, these Jacobians would uh, diverge and you, you have to think about what to do. And that's what Jeffrey explained for the maps. So I just want to get a connection to the maps. But we have it right here. So it says that a discrete formula, so Q at n plus 1, so at one of these times, is given by the integral going from Tn to n plus 1. It's written here in front of us. So Q at n plus 1 is what we had before, J, but now this is a one-time step J. So I started at n, 
and I go one Poincaré return around and then uh, I have my original noise here and I go one return around transpose and then I have a formula for the noise so this is computable. So this delta n, the noise I got by going, you know, one step around. Here's the formula. It says delta of n, and you know, I, I might have to worry about dimensionality. Maybe I'm supposed to write delta of n over average over the time or something. So the average diffusion in that time. The moment I've gotten to Poincaré section, it's very explicit that I cannot pretend that the noise is the same every place in a space, no matter how small my perturbation is, because the effective noise is integrated over the segment of the trajectory, and Jacobians depend where you are. They vary all over the space. And even if you're, even if you assume you had isotropic noise, so, you know, the simplest case that people always do, which is totally unphysical, is isotropic. So what they say is delta ij is proportional to the unit matrix, Kronecker delta ij. And it's same in all direction. And to agree with Einstein, they call it 2D, where this is Einstein diffusion. Diffusion coefficient. So even if I send it just one here, it's still not going to be a, a uniform noise, because this integral is a non-trivial integral. So this is the integral that, for example, uh, Sean Ding computes all the time. You know, this is... Uh, what you do when you study finite time, Lyapunov exponents, etc. In that case, you don't, you know, don't have a noise, but you have to look at JJ transpose. And by the way, this equation is a special e case of Sylvester equation. W uh, in Sylvester equation, these two matrices are different. This is called A, this is called B transpose. Sorry, if A equals B, that's the same equation, and that, you know, happens all the time in control literature. And for example, if Jeffrey decides to compute this matrix, the way you do this is the same way in which we solve this equation. We just numerically integrate this differential equation. You don't look at the solution. That's too complicated. But numerical integration is easy and uh, internet is replete with software how to integrate this equation because there are all kinds of good codes because people in control theory have to do it all the time. So this can be done. So this is a computable noise. And the main message is in nonlinear dynamics, if noise has something to do with entropy, let's say, in nonlinear dynamics, all entropy is local. So you never just average over noise over a whole space and you say, this is what the average noise are. That doesn't make any sense. You have to compute it region by region. And that's what now, now that we have made a connection between these two equations. And this connection is trivial if A is a constant, then it's totally obvious. But it's true also for any nonlinear flow with any noise on it. And it's computable and it's totally important because it tells us if we compute some solution of our problem, dynamical problem, but we only need finite resolution, that resolution we can describe as some covariance, saying that locally we need only seven digits of accuracy. So this noise has diffusion length that per one step uh, tells us seven digits of accuracy. So your computer produces noise, but nonlinear dynamics makes it nonlinear. So that you think it's good in seven digits doesn't mean anything. You have to compute it for every solution, but it's computable. It's great. It's wonderful. And the only thing, time when this fails, where you have to think a little bit harder, 
if this Jacobian has some extra marginal eigenmodus. See, marginal eigenmodus is always bad, and in diffusion they are bad because in the diffusion you um, you can just go every place, infinite distance. So you can't control your sub subject. So for us, marginal eigenvalues in dynamical si systems happen twice. They're non-generic, but they're imposed by dynamics first if you have a symmetry. So one has to rethink this in case of symmetries. And I'm totally open to it because I think it's very important. And uh, number one, number two, if you have a bifurcation, which is a non-generic thing, but if your parameter or system is such that dynamics doesn't know whether it's a fixed point or a hop cycle or something, that's what happens. In that case, you also have zero eigenvalues, and then you have to worry about what happens. And the Dutch school has thought about it. There is lots of literature about it. So people think about what happens when you have marginal noise around bifurcation. And you have to go higher order in perturbation theory than linear. You look at area functions and God knows what. But uh, it is a problem that people have thought about. It. So these are the two times that you have to think about. So now I made a connection from here. And for now on, one can continue with Jeffrey's lectures. Because now we know that we can always go from continuous flow to flow in which we have quotiented our time direction and now we are doing Poincaré sections and Jeffrey explained how you go about covering your strange attractor with these cigars until you kind of get a carpet which is dense and you cannot resolve any finer points on the strange attractor because they're all covered by your overlapping cigars and then you stop and that says that noise is your friend in spite of our intuition that noise is bad it's actually extremely good because it tells us when to stop. Because in determinism, you know, there's this mathematical obsession to describe the systems to infinite precision, but no, that can be done for a normal system. It, it has, as we'll see, its topology is infinitely complicated. Noise says, okay, you're done. And this is criterion, uh, when you, the overlaps work. And now I just want to finish with uh, a technical thing that was described by Jeffrey and I will use it in the course when I am discussing evolution of so-called uh, I know let's say Ruel evolution of but in this case there is another way to look about the solutions. So look at a case where the A matrix is strictly contracting, meaning its eigenvalues are all negative. Then when you look at the equation it just arises, you realize that if they're strictly negative, it doesn't matter how I kicked it initially because it'll forget what happened infinite time back because that's being contracted. So initial Q drops out and Q at the final time, let's just call it Q, meaning Q equals Q at infinity after many iterations. We'll only care, and I'm doing this for simplicity only for a fixed point, only care about the noise and then our equation said you have to integrate on the right is the Laplacian. You have to integrate on the left, not Laplacian, with the stability matrix T, D tau, 0 to infinity. So it says my invariance <coughs> in a steady state after I had, I've given dynamics infinite time to act, is noise and it's a whole memory of noise because this says I have to go time t back on the noise. But we're assuming the noise is constant so it looks very simple, everybody is very simple. So now uh, this matrix here, I saw it, everybody runs into this 
solution. For example, Paul Goldberg has a paper on it. Uh, you look at this solution and you say, wow, I mean, this looks pretty simple. You have to be able to evaluate this integral. And indeed, this integral can be evaluated. In literature, there is an uh, analytic solution, but it's not pretty. It's kind of work to do. But this integral can be massaged in a useful form by saying, what would happen if these are different times? So let me stick in the Dirac delta function, t minus t prime, written in a form appropriate to unit integral for plus minus infinity. And I can do this in d dimensions. I'm writing in one dimension, but I can do it in d dimensions. Well, no, it's time, so it's one dimension. I'm saying nonsense. Delta omega 2 pi e to the i omega t minus t prime. So that's a Dirac delta in representation, which is convenient when you have translational invariance, which you have here in time. All units of time are the same. And uh, it says that when I'm when this is zero, this gives me a bump which, whose integral is normalized to be one, any integral over it. And when the times are different, then this gives me zero. And now what I get up here is e to the t. This is all integrated. But these integrals I can do, these are just Laplace integrals. So e to t to something, integrate is 1 over that thing. And it has two limits. In zero limit, I get nothing. In the infinite limit, uh, I get zero. I mean, in zero part gives me 1. So when I do this integral, I get d omega 2 pi. So now I have a frequency domain representation of the solution of the Lapunov equation. So I have an explicit formula for the covariance, which is OK if A was strictly contracting. For example, this is the first time, I, first thing I did with this equation, I wrote that, and I said, so what? <laughs> Turns out, you know, I was stupid. So what is the big deal? Because this is the continuous form of the same equation that uh, Jeffrey did for the discrete version of the theory. So continuous form makes you worry about whether the these eigenvalues are positive or negative. And discrete form makes you worry about you'll get Jacobians rather than uh, this stuff. And it makes you worry about whether Jacobians have multipliers which are on the unit circle, outside the unit circle, etc. And now the thing that I don't feel very comfortable with, maybe Jeffrey does, uh, what we boldly assert is that this equation is true, you know, there are theorems, you can cite them, etc. This equation is true for all kinds of uh, dynamics described by the, you know, generator of deformation AT, both expanding and contracting. Now, what I've done here on the purpose, I've never mentioned Fokker Planck, etc. I just gave you an argument, which is statistical argument without any fancy operators, etc. But in Fokker Planck, it turns out, and you know, you can do it without ever uttering words evolution operator, it turns out that to do it correctly uh, when you have unstable directions, you have to divide some eigenvalues out. And it turns out the form of this is the same for the adjoint and for the evolution in normal time. So this formula, which we derived here for strictly contracting system, is true for all hyperbolic systems without marginal eigenvalues. And then the game is how to choose this contour, because this goes from minus infinity to infinity. This is in a complex plane. It's in a frequency domain. And then the beautiful miracle happens that you can actually factorize this into contracting, expanding part and cross parts, uh, the contour integrals vanish, as Jeffrey explained for the other version of the theory. So this, uh, all I wanted to say is that 
the discrete and continuous are very connected, they're identical, and that for any dynamical system that you have, if you have any way of specifying noise, so I can give you a random application done by physicists and biophysicists, Sara Solia and and experimentalists who looks at bird songs have used this to study how the bird, uh, uh, you know, a chick learns a song. <laughs> so in that case, you have a very good experimentally measured notion of noise, because what they can do is they can teach it slightly wrong songs experimentally and see how it responds, etc. So you can put pieces of this, you can put, estimate what the A is from the experiment and Q. In our applications, either people in lab tells us we can measure something to such and such accuracy and we put it into this noise, or we say I run a computer and I only care about 1% accuracy on my computer because it's a hard problem and then we put it in this noise, then machinery produces the real noise that nonlinear system gets. So this is totally open because nobody has really used it for interesting physical systems. We just play with models to see how it works, but you know. It's good to know that it works in two-dimensional maps to some extent. I believe it should work in high dimensions and I believe everything is doable. Yeah. If you care about it, you can compute it it's not any easier or harder than what, again, Sean Ding is doing on Kuramoto Shivashinsky. The machinery of computation is very similar. That's it. And I just don't know why it's physical. So I keep thinking of it. You know, the way we wrote this problem is linear. So I could do the following thing. I could use the irreducible representations of my symmetry. For linear symmetries, we know how to do this. And that, then I could insist that the noise works within each symmetry subspace. So, for example, we do this in quantum mechanics. You know, in quantum mechanics, noise is called e to the i over h bar instead of e to the over this delta. But uh, and we do it, and you know, it's really good. So maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe uh, there is a way. But whenever I think of it, it looks to me like it breaks symmetries. And I don't see a physical argument that you go in the lab with Brownian motion and the symmetries are preserved. But I might be wrong, so it's just worth thinking. I thought I should draw it up. One of the you know, things that make me very unhappy that I'm not very... It actually, whenever I don't understand something, I get happy and that's most of the time. So that works very well for me. So Ullenbeck went to kindergarten in Utrecht, I believe, or someplace in Holland, which had, you know, a bunch of uh, greatest physicists of 19th century come to that uh, kindergarten, and they had especially strong school in uh, speed skating, and they also had a especially strong school in, in uh, statistical physics, and they have it today, so he's uh, when he was old, he was professor at the University of Michigan, and what he would do every, you know, wet and wild meeting, but it was dry and boring meeting, yeah. he would have read this week's reviews of modern physics from beginning to the end. Because in those days, in the 50s and early 60s, it was about that thick. And every article was worth reading. It wasn't garbage like today. So, you know, it was the quality stuff. I mean, people took publishing seriously. He would read this whole issue, and then he would discuss one article he liked in the journal club. So this is kind of men or scientists, men and women, that existed and cannot exist today because it's impossible to deal with a stream of knowledge in the way they could do it. You know, they're both lucky and unlucky. I mean, there was so little that they could manage, and they were unlucky to live in times when there wasn't so much that we have today.